Okay, it's official. Howdy, everybody, one and all. Uh, welcome to um, class number four, Awakening Breath. That's it. I, I remember the title. Class number four. Uh, so um, let's see, thus far we have gone through um, the different tetrads. Uh, we've gone through Kayana Anupasana, Vedana Anupasana, and we are firmly into Chitta Anupasana. What do all those terms mean? Uh, let's go to the blackboard here. All right. Okay, good. Everybody seeing this? Lovely. All right. So um, here we are. Okay. So the chi, uh, uh, kayana anupasana or, or tracking mindfulness within the body, We've gone through the long breath, the short breath, extending this awareness of breath to the full body here. Um, and then uh, as we are have our awareness grounded within the body, um, calming the uh, bodily fabrications. So calming the various things that um, will hinder us. So uh, some have translated this to mean calming the formation of the breath itself so that it's barely perceptible. Uh, some people have uh, translated this as, you know, what are the distracting um, things that arise within the body? And we've had the conversation around the hindrances, the things that arise within us that are hindrances, obstructions to the path. So looking at um, craving, the aversion, unconsciousness, restlessness, doubt. How is it that we can cultivate equanimity in a way that can uh, subdue, uh, equanimize uh, these uh, hindrances? And then uh, leaning into the pleasant field tone that can be available. And how is it that we can stoke that pleasant field tone so that we're cultivating this um, a, a, a arising of energy so that we when it go into the, the piti and the sukha, uh, the rapture and happiness as it's translated. But I think that towards the end of that conversation, what felt very salient for people was uh, more the sense of um, kind of excitement uh, versus contentment, yeah? So how is it that we can stoke energy within the body, yeah? So that we can have this uh, intense wakeful quality, but also turning our attention towards the rapturous, uh, excited feeling within the body that can happen. Uh, and then, turning our attention away from kind of the, the energetic component into actually how it's um, our capacity to take in and enjoy, uh, derive some sustenance, derive some uh, contentment from that experience. Yeah? And so, you know, there's the opportunity to kind of go off into a jhana practice there as we're um, really going into cultivating uh, deeper states of concentration and uh, classically, uh, early Buddhism, that's how they went. There would be this sense of going into deep states of concentration to really refine the mind before we move into Vipassana. And uh, this Anapanasati structure, uh, these 16 exercises, uh, follow that. Yeah. So then that brought, brings us to what we we're doing last week, uh, breathing in, breathing out, sensitive to mental formations and calming mental formations. So here we have this um, pattern of expose yourself to something and then how is it that we can reduce the reactivity around it? Yeah. So uh, being aware of the, the momentary see, hear, feel experience, how is it that we can uh, equanimize this and be aware of the restful states within the mind? Um, so, you know, we're going into the mental formations, we're going into looking at the sankharas, the deep uh, volitional forces, the deep habit patterns that tend to arise. Uh, so whenever we uh, fall into fantasy planning daydream within um, our sitting practice, um, there's a sense of volition, there's a sense of, of goading, there's a sense of doing within that. Yeah. You know? um, so uh, uh, it's important to be aware of that process because as we go through the day to day life, um, all of these driver sensations come up, all of these reactivity comes up and goad us to go in particular directions. And do we really want to? Um, is that really our best choice? Are there certain habit patterns of reactivity that we would like to work through you know, that previously have tethered us to a sense of discontent? Yeah. So 
that brings us into here, citta anupassana, or uh, mindfulness of mind. Um, and so uh, previously I had this structured as an eight week class and then I noticed, Michael? yeah, go ahead. Michael? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, go, go ahead, you have a question? Can you hear me? Uh, I, I yeah. yes. Um, Go on. The latter two in the second tetra. You, can you hear me? Uh, you're cutting in and out a I'm little trying. bit. I'm trying. If you can't hear me, uh, just say so and we'll go on. I'm asking about the second. Hmm. The latter two uh, sensitive mental formations, calming mental formations. Then skip me. Never mind. Okay, if you'd like, you can put the question. I have a bad line or something. I'm sorry. Yeah. Forget it. Well, well, why don't you put the question in the chat? Time. If you put the question in the chat, then I can read it that way and, and I'd, I'd be happy to answer it. Go on. Okay, great. Okay, uh, so okay. Uh, feel, feel free to put that in the chat. Uh, otherwise, I'll introduce what we're, we're working with here. Uh, so, interestingly, we can see that um, as we are working in the body, we're already start to go into the feel tone of pleasant, yeah, uh, in order to transition us into uh, Vedana Anapasana, working with feel tone. And in particular, the first two exercises are about leaning into the pleasant feel tone. Um, and then the second two here, we're start to work towards the mind. We're sensitizing ourselves to the mind, or at least the mental formations. And here's the thing, the mental formations, this is, this is where we live. Uh, unfortunately, um, you know, there's a, such a thing called the default mode network. Um, so whenever we're not fully engaged uh, in an activity or we're not fully, um, how should we say, um, uh, uh, integrated within our environment, uh, certain networks of the brain just turn on uh, that are the default mode network that essentially uh, uh, um, infuse our experience with uh, fantasy planning, daydream, thoughts of the past, projections of the future. Um, so it kind of gives us, it orients us a little bit in a time, space, and a role of self, um, as opposed to just kind of floating about a non-self, which uh, to the untrained mind is disorienting, but to the trained mind is um, something that we um, could potentially put as an objective or a goal to work towards. So here we are uh, observing the mental formations. In a, sense, in a sense, we can look at it as becoming aware of the default mode network turning on and how is it that we can turn it off? And by continually turning it off and building the, the opposing uh, side, the, the, the um, attentional um, task positive uh, network, um, that ideally becomes more of our resting place rather than the default mode network, which is distraction and anxiety. Um, you know, we're trying to uh, 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 recalibrate ourselves so that our default mood becomes more of the attentional network where we're awake, mindful, present time oriented. So that's part of the long-term effects that will happen uh, as we examine and work through uh, getting caught within the mental formations. And as you can see, even though we're in the feeling tone um, uh, category here, we're already working with mind. So. Here we have, we're going to be looking at all of these four here, experiencing the mind, gladdening the mind, steadying the mind, liberating the mind. That's what we have on the plate today. Okay, so here we have listing the tetrads. So the more classical uh, um, interpretation, number nine, one trains oneself, I'll breathe in, experiencing mind, one trains oneself, I'll breathe out, experiencing mind. Number 10, one trains oneself, I'll breathe in, gladdening mind. One trains oneself, I'll breathe out, gladdening mind. One trains oneself, I will breathe in, steadying mind. One trains oneself, I'll breathe out, steadying mind. And 12, one trains oneself, I'll breathe in, liberating mind. One trains oneself, I'll breathe out, liberating mind. No small task, for sure. So this is what we have to look forward to this evening. Um, so let me just kind of put myself up in the corner here. Number nine, let's go into each one uh, at a time here. Uh, I condensed it to, I will breathe experiencing mind. What does this mean? So step nine, mindful alertness or sampajana. Uh, that's a term um, 
uh, sometimes translated as complete comprehension, full knowing. Um, it's knowing what the mind is saddled with, yeah? knowing what this mind-body experience is going through. Um, sometimes it's uh, been translated with the connotation of understanding and tracking uh, 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 the mind. So, you know, if impermanence is a thing uh, that is um, ever present, all of our um, subjective and objective experience are subject to impermanence, but really when we turn our focus towards uh, inside or subjective experience, we can notice that there are some experiences of solidity, but a lot of it is quite a bit in movement. Yeah? I mean, just starting with the breath, the breath itself is always in motion. So there's a sense of tracking, how so that we can allow ourselves in present time, just be with uh, the motion of. So we're, we're tracking the motion, the movement of the mind and attempting to find a sense of balance. So that's a theme that's, that's, that's evident here in this tetrad. So sensitizing ourselves to the state of mind while we're focusing on the breath. So um, I might've mentioned a couple of times already this idea of peripheral awareness. So in my, my uh, vision, I'm looking at the glasses, but my peripheral vision, I can still see uh, my computer monitor and the lights around and then the room around that. So there's these kind of uh, uh, almost like concentric rings of visual um, experience here of peripheral vision. So similarly, what we're doing in, in this practice is we're building this ever widening peripheral awareness. So going from uh, the body, the sensations of the body, noting the pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, uh, uh, quantizing the unpleasant hindrances, leaning into, attending to the pleasant so that we kind of stoke that energy. And then we moved into the mind here. So here we are, number nine, breathing in, experiencing mind. So in a way, it's like the, um, you know, if the, the mental fab, uh, uh, fabrications, the, the sensory impressions of see, hear, and feel are, we're no longer identifying with them. And we can kind of really see kind of what's behind. What is this, this faculty of awareness? I mean, right now, just as you're sitting listening, can you contact that, just that brightness, that awakeness? quality, just that feeling of being alive, experienced in the body, experienced in the mind. And if you move the attention from the body and more into the head space, you know, what is that experience? You know, that which is seeing, that which is hearing. Yeah. So we're moving a little closer into that, being able to cultivate this palette to discern the mental uh, space, the mental state. Um, so we're sensitizing ourselves to focusing on the breath, but also how that influences this experience of our mental state. So the ability to observe the mind in this way is helpful uh, in three ways. Uh, number one, we can figure out uh, what needs to be changed to bring the mind into right concentration. Yeah, so um, normally, um, if we have this metaphor of the seesaw, um, you know, too much balance imbalance one side too much imbalance of another side so when we're meditating um, oftentimes when we're new to the practice we have this experience of uh, the on off switch yeah so we walk into a room the light is off we flick it the light is on just on off that's all we have are the two settings so when we come to meditate it's like oh i'm going to meditate so i'm going to sit i'm going to be upright and i'm going to be awake and pay attention so the mind says, oh, that means we're gonna be scattered and uh, uh, um, distracted and think a lot of thoughts, you know, overly uh, uh, scattered, overly energized in that way. But then we say, no, 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 we're, 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 we're relaxing, we're, we're calming, we're letting go, we're being peaceful, we're being still. And the mind says, oh, that means that we're, being asleep, we're falling asleep now. And so that's what happens is we, 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 in the early stages of our meditation practice, we're either scattered, distracted, and restless, or we're falling asleep. And so what we're doing is the nervous system is just flipping this on off switch until it finds this dimmer where there's this just right balance of awakeness, alertness, and restfulness and calm abiding. So um, we're experimenting with that within the body. So how is it that the breath and awareness can 
help us with that dimmer switch within um, the, the mental state. So the ability to uh, figure out what needs to be changed to, bright, uh, to bring the mind to right concentration, to bring ourselves into balance. So it helps you to figure out how to stay settled there. Yeah. And so when we find that right balance, all right, how can we just kind of chill out there and just kind of be there? So concentration, uh, some people have termed it as being able to, you know, that skill set of being able to um, hold in our attention what we deem relevant to the exclusion of what is irrelevant. So that's one way to look at it. Um, uh, in the Buddhist sense, there's that um, concentration is the natural state of the mind once the hindrances are extracted. Uh, awake, alert, and um, non-harried, non-agitated. Uh, yeah. So number three, when concentration has been mastered, it allows you to observe the fabrications at work in right concentration so you can find the escape from them. So when we touch upon these states, places, moments in our meditation where we are oh, sufficiently awake, uh, sufficiently relaxed and calm, and there's not a lot of mental activity, there's not a lot of mental formations happening. Um, uh, uh, Buddha Dasa uh, uses the metaphor in his book, um, The Heartwood of the Bodhi Tree. Uh, he talks about as though you're looking into a placid, crystal clear lake, and because the water is calm and clear, we can see the fish you know, swim up to us from a distance away. You know, so we can see, oh, here comes a fish. And that's what it is. It's totally a fish. <laughs> it's just a fish. Cool. As opposed to the experience, if anybody's had that experience of being in the ocean and the waves are frothing and all over the place, and then something kind of like, you know, squiggly and slimy, just like kind of slips against your leg. and ugh. <laughs> It's like we get overtaken by that in a way that when the mind is harried, uh, and our reactive patterns show up, we become um, disrupted and um, distracted and maybe even, um, uh, uh, how shall we say, dysregulated uh, by our habit patterns popping in. So contrasting that to what we're att attaining here is getting the mind to a place where it becomes like the crystal clear lake. So eventually when the thoughts come, it's like, oh, okay, that's a thought. You know, when the reactive pattern comes of what? What's your reactive pattern? Uh, uh, restlessness, doubt, um, you know, the inner critic comes up, uh, you know, planning. Where is it that your mind likes to go when you sit? You'll be able to see that, you know, more from a distance or the early stage of those thoughts as they're being born. And you can see, oh, that's what it is. And that's the seeing component of it. That's the hearing component, the feeling component. And I'm not engaging. So experiencing mind, we're looking for ways that we can kind of balance the mind out, know what it is that we need. Feel free to, to jump in with any questions at any time. Uh, and of course, feel free to use the chat too. So uh, number 10 here, uh, I'll breathe in gladdening the mind. Right? Breathe out gladdening the mind. So. Step 10 is primarily motivating and energizing the mind. Yeah? The gladdening experience. Uh, because rapture, PT, can be either physical or mental. Yeah? So just like in uh, uh, steps three and four of the breath, two, three, four, actually, no, I'm sorry, that's more like five and six. Uh, yeah, I can't amend that here. So when we're working with, oh, you know what I'll do? I'll just cover it there. It's supposed to say five, six. So just like when we were cultivating PT and sukha within the body, okay, here can we uh, uh, breathe in a way, inclining ourselves towards the pleasant attributes of breath and how that might uh, facilitate an energetic rise within the body that is pleasant. Yeah? And then the next stage, how is it that we can derive some satisfaction, enjoyment, contentment out of that, that was in the body in the gladdening of the mind, we're doing that exercise again, but rather than focusing on the body, we're focusing on the mental state. How does that brighten the mind? How does that energize the mind? How does that gladden the mind? Yeah, so really the seesaw. It's like, oh, okay, I'm getting a little lethargic here, falling asleep, okay. Breathing, 
with the peripheral awareness of in the mental state, how can we raise that energy up? So this is what exercise 10 is about, being able to energize the mind. So step 10, gladdening the mind. A uh, quote from the Nisarabhikkhu in his book, Right Mindfulness, is the rapture felt by an arahat, an arahat is an enlightened individual, is a rapture felt by an arahat when reflecting on the fact that his, her mind is totally free from passion, aversion, and delusion. So there's something to be said about that in the absence of the hindrances. Uh, the mind comes to the place of being settled and uh, uh, alert, awake. Uh, in this respect, he's focusing on the gladdening aspect of it. So um, I have this little side note here of the narrow focus versus broad. At first, we have this narrow focus, yeah, starting on this like narrow focus on the frenum, uh, the tip of the nose, what have you, and then we're just slowly working up this peripheral awareness, as I was saying before. So focusing on on what is relevant, rejecting slash repressing other activity or disregarding. And as we go on, we're continually building out this awareness. So we are find that we're doing these same exercises that we're doing in the body uh, and in feel tone, but building out this peripheral awareness of how it influences the mind. Okay. Okay. We good so far? Questions? All right, moving right along. 11, uh, breathe in, steadying the mind, or breathe out, steadying the mind. So, steadying the mind. Again, the, the seesaw. So, sometimes steadying the mind, uh, synonyms concentrating, uh, balancing. Uh, there's the term ekagata. Um, ekagata sometimes is, means uh, concentration in terms of like a single point focus. So there can be that sense of like, all right, I'm starting off with the narrow focus. Just my attention is just on the frame. I'm just that little divot under the nose and all of my attention and energy goes into that to the exclusion of all the distraction as I'm starting off this Anapanasati practice. We can look at that single point focus yeah, in that way, or really any object of focus that we take having that like steady pouring of attention. They talk about it in metaphors of like an oil lamp just dripping, pouring oil down. Our attention is just pouring onto the object of focus. So there's that interpretation of ekagata as uh, concentration. In the Abhidhamma or uh, uh, Buddhist psychology, um, you know, there's all the different mental uh, factors, all the different kind of, you know, the ingredients of mind. Um, the ekagata component serves as the uh, 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 element that uh, coordinates and balances all the other elements of mind to work together in concert. Yeah. So uh, in contrast, the absence of ekagata, just reflect upon the last time where you felt very overwhelmed, overly stressed, uh, late for a deadline, and all of these things are running around in your mind and you're just overwhelmed. Yeah. It's a place of distraction, of urgency, of uh, uh, the thoughts not coming together correctly. You know, there's an absence of ekagata. You know, so in, in steadying the mind, we're cultivating this quality of ekagata, which kind of brings everything in balance. So uh, there's this nice metaphor uh, that a monk friend of mine, Damananda of Maitri Vihara um, uh, Temple, um, he talks about it as though, uh, you know, gravity uh, within the planet. You know, without gravity, all the objects will just kind of float off, but then the gravity happens, boom, everything is just balanced, coordinated, and is able to work in concert. Same thing that gravity with throughout the uni universe, all these different elements exerting this gravitational force that is just allowing them all to kind of work in concert together. So the, the, the gladdening the mind, you know, getting into the PT component, but how it affects the mental state, but we don't want it to get too crazy. And then we're cultivating the ekagata to balance it out. So it's like the mind is sufficiently brightened, but everything kind of working uh, in, in a way kind of balanced and coordinated. So in a way, the, the gladdening and balancing of the mind work together as the two sides of the, uh, of the seesaw, so to speak. So number nine, let's experience the mind. What's going on? Is the mind sluggish? Is it broad? Is it narrow? Is it quick? Is it restless? What do you need? And then here, here we have your options. Do we need to gladden it a little bit more? Do we need to balance it out? 
You know, so this is the experiment that we have, how to cultivate that. And we develop the various flavors of concentration. So developing the palate for concentration, there's the contact flavor of concentration as uh, object uh, before in the body, now in the mind. Okay, Kitisuka, we've talked about that. And there's something about this. If we can kind of connect with, cultivate the gladdening and balancing of the mind, uh, again, um, we can look at this in terms of, you know, skill sets that we are cultivating as we work towards enlightenment, towards awakening, towards liberation. But uh, we could also look at them in terms of, um, you know, not necessarily mutually exclusive, but uh, experience, but we can look at it in terms of how this shifts our baseline experience off the cushion. You know, if we can really tap into this gladdening and balancing of the mind uh, and take that with us off the cushion, you know, we're not bored again. Uh, uh, because, you know, the boredom is the distracted, sluggish, lethargic, restless, <laughs> agitated mind. Um, and if we can get into and, and build the skill sets of gladdening and balancing the mind, then we can just be aware of what the mind is like and needing and constantly be recalibrating in a way. So it doesn't matter what we do, we can be fully engaged. So is that to look forward to? And then number 12, I'll breathe, liberating the mind. Yeah. So essentially, once we get to this point, the mind is technically already liberated. You know, so for, for the mind to be sufficiently joyful and balanced and coordinated, that means that, you know, the mind is, um, uh, we've cultivated the conditions sufficient for the mind to just be at rest, uh, behave naturally, um, uh, void of the hindrances, void of craving, aversion, unconsciousness, restlessness, doubt. So just by going into 12, we've already arrived somewhat liberated. Yeah, so how can we just keep that going? Abide in that state. So we have this open spacious awareness. So last two exercises of the second tetrad, um, the balancing and coordinating. Um, let's see, before all of that, there's the mental formations, the inner rumination, uh, the self-referencing system, of the see, hear, feel of the mental formations. Um, you know, again, with when the mind is balanced and clear and we can see the fish coming towards us uh, or in the crystal clear lake, when the mind is uh, sufficiently clear, gladdened and balanced, you know, inevitably the habit patterns want to come, but we can see them for what they are. This just the seeing, hearing, feeling and the not engaging in that. We're relinquishing these patterns moment by moment. Okay, I see that for what it is. I don't need to engage that. Okay, I can put that down. I don't really need to put energy into that. So we're, we're, we're relinquishing um, just the reactive habits. Uh, so, you know, a couple, I think it was last class that we were talking about the uh, avijja sankara, the ignorance and the mental formations there, the ignorance in our reactive patterns. So we don't know what's going on the reactive pattern comes up, we go to sleep, and then boom, we're, we're off identified with our anger, fear, sadness, and we stumble through the world creating chaos for ourselves and others. Uh, so this is the, the opposite. Uh, we're in a place where the mind is settled, and we can see inevitably their habit patterns, so they want to come back. But if the mind is sufficiently balanced and gladdened, uh, placid, then we can see it for what it is, and know we can say, yeah, I see you, <laughs> and no thanks. And by that constant shedding and releasing, then we can continue to sustain this experience of having a liberated mind. Now then, um, sorry, just dropping things here. So between gladdening and balancing the seesaw, yeah, the mind is, is liberated. So again, I like that term because the habit patterns associated with our discontent and how it tends to colonize and grip our mind, or conversely, how the mind grasps at and uh, stays identified with uh, our habit patterns of suffering by you know, being able to see the habit patterns for what they are and we don't grasp. We're constantly shedding this habit. We are, we are no longer shackled, we're no longer bound, we're liberated in that respect. 
we have broken that uh, habit pattern of that unconscious habit pattern of identification with our suffering. So yes, that's the criteria for a liberated mind. So congratulations, your mind is liberated. Yeah. Now then, um, awakening is not a black and white thing. It's not like, yes, uh, you have this one experience and then you're now deeply enlightened. But uh, it's, it's a gradual process. There's degrees, gradients of it. So when you have the moments of the mind being balanced, clear, and you're not fixating or engaging in suffering, then yes, that counts. Uh, 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 that's a, a moment of liberation that you can put in the bank account. You know? uh, and as you keep acquiring more and more of those moments, then they tend to deepen, become more profound and auger into the deeper, deeper uh, roots of our suffering. So um, again, um, if, if the metaphor for awakening is getting wet, uh, a lot of the stories uh, uh, depict awakening as though we fall in the pool, one moment we're dry and then there's a big splash and then now I'm immersed with water, meaning I was totally this unconscious reactive being and then boom, I had this one experience on the meditation cushion and now I'm an awakened being. It don't happen like that. Maybe for some people, but I think for the majority of people, um, it's like walking in a fine mist, taking a long hike through a misty, foggy day. Um, so after miles and miles and miles, we just gradually accumulate the dampness around until eventually we are soaked. But it's this gradual process. So just allowing yourself to create the conditions to uh, allow the mind to be uh, awake, balanced, and free of the hindrances. Um, you're acquiring these moments of liberation that then begin to take hold, so to speak. So I just want to say that to kind of uh, uh, demystify uh, some of these um, ideas, concepts of liberation and awakening, enlightenment. Uh, it's not something to be dipped in gold, put on the wall and worshipped from afar. These are real tangible daily life experiences that we have, that the more that we can cultivate a palate to discern when they arise, notice it when they do happen, and then you know remember them. Uh, then they tend to firm up and become more available to us. Uh, I just wanna um, say that much there. Um, so a bit on equanimity. So a lot of this is about the discerning and knowing, but that equanimity, you know, that equanimity acceptance uh, towards the hindrances early on is what helps to calm the bodily fabrications. That having equanimity towards the mental fabrications, towards the see, hear, feel, tends to allow us to calm the mental formations. So there's something about this bringing this equanimity towards whatever it is that we're experiencing that has this um, effect of diminishing and letting go of the toxic effects of the negative while simultaneously enhancing um, the, the wholesome expression of the positive. Um, so equanimity, um, it, it's kind of my go-to, um, but I, I know a lot of people have a difficulty with it. What does that mean? Um, so I was recently talking with somebody and, and we were kind of having that conversation of, okay, what is this equanimity thing? Um, for anybody that's practiced loving kindness or metta meditation, look at it that way. Whatever it is that you notice there's that moment of discerning, making contact. Now, can you have some metta towards it? Can you bring some loving kindness towards that experience? So you're having these kind of like minute, surgically applied metta loving kindness practices towards whatever it is you notice. So we, we balance and gladden the mind, so to speak, and then whatever arises, we just throw some metta at it, throw some loving kindness at it in that way. And that might subdue uh, uh, our, our want to grasp at it and whatever is pleasant tends to uh, become enhanced, so to speak. Um, yeah. Um, just want to end on this thought here. Um, so this is uh, Tanisha Bhikkhu's translation of the Samadhi Sutta. It says, as for the individual who has attained both internal tranquility of awareness and insight into phenomena through heightened discernment, uh, their duty is to make an effort in establishing or tuning those very same skillful qualities to a higher degree for the ending of the effluence. Uh, so the effluence, what does that mean? Um, I might have 
used that term earlier, the effluence, um, that's the English term that they use for the poly term of uh, the asavas. Uh, the effluence, if you look it up, um, uh, uh, it, it means kind of the um, you know, toxic waste that leaches into a groundwater system. So let's just say you have a well here, that's your drinking water, but maybe there's some kind of, I don't know, farm over here that uses a lot of fertilizer, what have you, that's leaching into the ground and somehow getting into your water supply. It's bringing this toxicity, thus tainting the entirety of the water supply. Um, using that metaphor for this mind-body experience, if we're working to purify it, uh, there's these toxic habit patterns that come up that tend to toxify our perception, our uh, view, um, our whole sense of experiencing self and world. So this experience of calming the bodily formations, calming the mental formations, gladdening, balancing the mind, and then recognizing, be aware of the experience of uh, uh, balancing ourselves in the mind-body process free of this toxicity, good. You know, we can keep that for a few moments. Um, but again, as I was saying, the more that we do that, the deeper that augurs into you know, the, 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 the deeper roots of our own toxic habit patterns that begins to uproot them. Right? So this is the, the, the ending of the effluence, as they say, or you know, just getting rid of these habits. Yeah. So calming formations, we can get a sense of rest. So it's important to just, we can start off by just noting the space in between the thoughts. And those little spaces begin to grow and deepen, so to speak, uh, until we abide in this open spacious awareness. So that's pretty much what we're gonna be working on tonight. Uh, so I just wanted to, um, how shall we say, uh, uh, kind of get into the ideas, the thoughts, uh, uh, the, the theory of that before we get into the sit. But uh, any questions? questions, comments upon any of the material that we've covered thus far. Uh, let's see, uh, I'm looking at the chat. Uh, one of the questions is, uh, is losing oneself in unbridled joy to be avoided? Um, yeah, that's a, a, a good question there that can be taken in different ways. I mean, if we're uh, uh, losing ourselves to unbridled joy in a sense that we're, um, you know, it's an unskillful expression of unbridled joy. If we're falling into, uh, uh, you know, the craving component of the pleasant and kind of losing ourselves, um, yeah, that's probably not something that we should work towards. Uh, losing oneself to unbridled joy to be avoided. Well, if we look at it in, in terms of kind of cultivating steeper states of concentration, as associated with what's implied here in, in the Piti and Sukha in terms of cultivating jhana, then um, no, that is a, a good thing. Um, this is something, and we were having a discussion about this uh, earlier in our morning sit group about kind of the concentration component and how we don't hear a lot about concentration uh, or really what I would say, we don't hear enough about concentration. Um, you know, there's a lot of mindfulness uh, cultures, uh, a lot of the present day Vipassana movement cultures that really you know, shun concentration exercises. Um, so there's some history to that as to why that happens. Uh, but um, uh, uh, I think that in, in some of the cultures that I've been in, involved in, some of the, the groups that I've been involved in, there's this misunderstanding that I think is kind of, I don't know, I, I think, indicative of a lot of the, the contemporary mindfulness movement that there's a sense of, all right, there's mindfulness and then there's concentration and Buddha practiced concentration in jhana and such like that. And he found ultimately when he would come out of these states, there was no fundamental difference of who he was. It wasn't until he developed the insight practices and the Vipassana practices that true awakening would happen. So that Vipassana uh, is kind of interpreted as kind of a lot of kind of just you know, casual mindfulness. Um, and so there's this sense of like, you know, mindfulness good, concentration bad, let's just throw it out. Uh, but in the suttas, if you read the early uh, uh, scripts, 
over and 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 over again, Buddha talks about, all right, whatever it is in various places, whatever it is you notice, look at it, bring that in. What is that like in the mind, in the body, in all of these different facets of knowing? Take that all the way through to deep concentration of merging of subject and object of you know, working it through the jhanas and then come out of that and into insight, from insight into back into the jhana. So there's something about being able to, going back to what you're saying, unbridled joy, well, really what that's meaning here is working into the, um, the, uh, 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 the jhanas. So that's what you're doing is you're cultivating concentration and allowing kind of this energy to kind of raise up and then bit by bit, we're just kind of take, we're extracting the hindrances, we're extracting the agitating factors so that ultimately we come to a place of a very balanced equanimity where all that's left is uh, upeka ekagata or the equanimity and that balanced concentration. And that would be for the rupa jhanas. And then when we go into the non-bodily or arupa jhanas, there's uh, different aspects of it. So yes, it has its place. Uh, uh, once we can have sufficient concentration built up, then you know, that access concentration is something that's available. Then when we do our Vipassana, our insight practice, then we're really able to scour deep into our experience. Uh, otherwise, you know, uh, um, you know, a concentration without mindfulness, there's no deep shifting of self and world towards liberation. Yet, you know, mindfulness or Vipassana without concentration, you know, we're just superficially looking at how we kind of bang our heads against the wall. So it's when they dovetail together, um, you know, the shamatha and the vipassana working together, that's when we have um, you know, the capacity for some real change, for sure. Uh, another question in the chat, what's the difference between the effluence and the hindrances? This is a very good question. Um, so the, the hindrances uh, feels, we could say that maybe that the hindrances are a subset of the effluence in a way, yeah? So the affluence would, would the, the hindrances in a way seem kind of more general. This is again, editorial commentary by me. This is just my interpretation. Um, the hindrances are kind of general. There's craving, aversion, unconsciousness, restlessness, doubt. Um, the affluence seemed to me to be like, all right, how does that personally show up in you? you know, I like to say that stress is something that is universal. We're all subject to stress, but how it affects each of us how we all tend to come apart under stress is individual to each of us. What are our own habit patterns? So in that way, your own habit pattern of toxicity, your own habit patterns around suffering would be kind of your own effluence. You know, how do they kind of work together in concert to make you miserable? <laughs> so there's that sense of, you know, it talks about rather than, it takes them out of context of kind of these things that exist that influence consciousness to how do they act as this kind of unconscious volitional force that comes up and takes over your, your perception of self and world. Um, so I, I don't know if, the, if you find that to be um, relevant and helpful, but that's how I, I see how those two concepts dovetail. Okay. How about we get into some sitting? So allow yourself to come to a comfortable upright position. Allowing yourself to straighten up and settle in. 
settling into posture of the body and settling into awareness. This quality of awakeness, brightness, experience of the mind. We can begin to just familiarize ourselves with this. As we turn our attention towards the breath. Inclining yourself to notice, be aware of, be awake for this full body of breath. That is to say, the in-breath, top of the in-breath, out-breath, base of the out-breath. Really allowing yourself to just get into the breath. Feel the yumminess of the breath. Allow it to really occupy all the real estate of your mind, of your attention. You notice in each of those points, stages of breath, what are the pleasant qualities? So from the beginning, the in-breath. From the top of the in-breath, they have the gladdening of the mind qualities. Now the out-breath, base of the out-breath have the balancing of the mind quality. But for now, just paying attention to the pleasant qualities of breath. Feeling this throughout the full body. Noticing how being aware of the breath influences, affects this experience of the full body. So right now paying attention to the pleasant field tone associated with breath. And how that's a resourcing factor. calming the bodily fabrications, any of these qualities of the hindrances that arise felt experienced in the body. How can we bring the sense of equanimity, acceptance, friendliness, just directing some qualities of metta towards the unpleasant, how that may hopefully bring the sense of quelling any reactivity ideally making this body a little bit more of a vehicle for a safer, more pleasant abiding.
And then of course the Piti Sukha piece, again, we don't have to fall into deep states of jhana, but can we create the conditions to incline uh, energetic positivity? So whatever you, uh, uh, we can start off by tuning your awareness towards whatever is remotely pleasant. Again, we can mind the breath to notice the pleasant qualities. And whenever you notice something pleasant, just give yourself permission to feel that, which by definition is a pleasant moment, which you give yourself permission to feel, which is a pleasant moment. And you can create this positive feedback loop, which may begin to increase this overall experience of positivity, or at least create the conditions. We may eventually incline ourselves in that direction. Allowing yourself to just feel a sense of contentment from this. This is more the sukha, just allowing yourself to derive a sense of contentment, nourishing, satisfaction, not needing anything else, settling in. So we can look at this Piti and Sukha as a way of gladdening and balancing the body. And we can begin to open up our awareness towards the mental fabrications. Last week we were working with just this interplay of noticing the seeing, hearing, feeling experience. 
So when an image rises associated with fan fantasy, planning, daydream, it's just a moment of seeing. When the internal talk arises, the inner critic, the judge, the narrative, the stories play out that we hear. It's just a moment of hearing. Any ways they might impact or fuel some of the emotions within the body, it's just a moment of feeling. Disentangle the narrative, don't get caught in the narrative. Just notice the movement of the mind and body. So we can keep the breath in the foreground and just in the background, just notice seeing, hearing, feeling. Or we can notice this flux and flow of seeing, hearing, feeling with the breath in the background. It's up to you, however you choose to work. And just allow the rise and fall of seeing, hearing, and feeling without clinging, grasping, fixating. Just discerning, noticing when they arise and shining this light of equanimity, acceptance, kindness towards. And if you want, you can use this labeling set of see, hear, and feel. It sounds something like this, feel. See and feel, hear, feel, and so on like that. good. So we can put that down and just rest in this awareness. Just like when we we're starting off, just contacting this brightness, aliveness experienced in the mind. We're no longer focusing on an, the mental fabrications, but just this quality of awareness. Noticing how is the mind, this quality of awareness itself. Bright, vast, expansive, pliant, flexible, narrow, agitated, harried, fixated. Just noticing, experiencing mind.
Breathing in, breathing out, gladdening the mind. So again, just as we were doing earlier of cultivating piti, cultivating that positive feedback loop. Let's reconnect with mining the breath, cultivating the positive feedback loop, but focusing on how that shifts, influences the mental state, how that shift influences and in gladdening awareness. And breathing in, breathing out, balancing the mind. So just as we were cultivating sukha in the body earlier, cultivating just this awareness of contentment, paying attention to the breath in this way, how, does, how do we derive a sense of contentment, enjoyment, satisfaction, nourishing from it? Can we reconnect with that, but rather than paying attention to the body, paying attention to this mental state, giving yourself permission to enjoy, be content, and how that influences awareness. It's balancing the mind.
I'm just noticing the mind. Does it need flattening or balancing out? But to whatever degree the mind feels peaceful, placid, awake, and alert, and aware, appreciate that. Appreciate the experience of the mind liberated from hindrances. Breathing in, breathing out, liberating the mind. Okay, at ease everyone. I'm going to turn the camera off for the question and answer period. Okay, so thank you everybody for all of your, your time, your attention, and your work this evening. Um, again, this will be put up on the YouTube, so uh, if you'd like to use the recorded uh, meditation as a support for you as we go from week to week, in terms of uh, building and uh, building upon these um, uh, uh, skill sets, uh, that is there for you. Uh, so we can end up with the dedication of merit. Uh, by the merits of these acts and other such virtues, may we attain a liberation for the benefit of all beings. We bow before those who come before us on the path after us and to those who walk beside us on the path. Thank you, everybody. Have yourselves a wonderful week. I hope to see you all next week.